All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Censorship of Children's Book Books, a conversation with the creators of Something Happened in Our Town and One of a Kind Like Me. I'm Betsy Gomez, the Band Book Speak Coalition Coordinator. My pr pronouns are she, her. I'm excited to be your moderator today. A quick note, time permitting, we will have an open Q&A at the end of the panel. So please add your questions to the comments on Facebook. We'll do our best to respond to as many of them as we can. Before I ask our panelists to introduce themselves, I'd like to thank all of the organizations, libraries, schools, bookstores, publishers, and individuals who are participating in Banned Books Week. Thank you for supporting the right to read and showing the world that books unite us, censorship divides us. Let's meet our panelists, the authors of Something Happened in Our Town, a child's story about racial injustice, and one of a kind like me. Marianne, would you like to kick us off? Sure, and again, thank you so much for inviting us. My name is Marianne Chilano. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a uh, family psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia, and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Emory University School of Medicine. Good afternoon. My name is Marietta Collins, and my pronouns are she, her, and, and hers. Um, I am an associate professor at Morehouse School of Medicine in the Department of Family Medicine and also in psychiatry and um, behavioral sciences. I'm um, a former colleague of both, of both Mary Ann's and Ann's as a faculty member at Emory. Hi, and I'm Ann Hazard, the third member of this trio of psychologists. And as has been mentioned, we, we all met at Emory where we were uh, faculty uh, members, although I was in pediatrics and we're the authors of Something Happened in Our Town. Uh, and my pronouns are she, her. Hello everyone, my name is Lauren Mayano. I'm the author of One of a Kind Like Me, which in Spanish is Unico Como Yo, it's a bilingual book. And the book is based on my family. So it tells you a little bit about my family when you read the book. And um, in addition to being an author, I am also a consultant. I do equity and justice work with nonprofit organizations. And my pronouns are she, her, and I'm calling in from Olone Chochenya land, which is also known as Berkeley, California. What's up everybody? My name is Robert Lutherio and I am an author and illustrator from Oakland, California. And I am the illustrator for one of a kind like me, Unico Como Yo. And uh, I wrote and illustrated a book called For Khan's First Flat Top and most recently illustrated another book called uh, Alejandria Fights Back. And all of those books are bilingual books and really happy to be here. All right, thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm very excited to be moderating this program. So first question, some people in our audience may not be familiar with what happened to your books. Could you kick us off with a brief description of your book and the events around the censorship of the title? And I'd like to start with Marianne, Marietta, and Anne. Sure, I'll, I'll start and then you guys jump in. Um, Something Happened in Our Town um, was um, released in 2018 and it's the story of two children, one black and one white, as they confront questions about an African-American man in their community who was shot by a police officer. It's a fictional account, obviously. And the kids bring home to their respective families their questions and the families discuss racial bias with them and how to confront racial injustice. And then the kids apply what they've learned to a classroom situation in which a new immigrant child is excluded from an activity because the other kids in the class don't think he speaks English well and therefore he must not play soccer well. And so they don't include him. Um, we also have back matter in the book that helps parents um, understand the rationale for talking about this with their kids, how to, you know, child-friendly definitions of race and racism, sample child-parent dialogues um, and specific guidance for African-American families. And so there's a fair amount of attention um, to the back matter um, to adults who might be reading the book to the children. My understanding is that the book has been challenged um, primarily, I guess, beginning in the, in the fall of 2020 and also throughout this year on the basis of perception that it has what's called divisive language and also the perception that the book is anti-police we do not feel like the book is anti-police and we can talk about that later, but those are the primary reasons that it has been challenged. 
and it's been challenged in um, primarily in school, not in public libraries, but in school libraries and as part of a school curriculum um, in places like um, Vermont, California, Nebraska, Tennessee, Wisconsin, a number of different states. Um, what I'd like to add, aside from what Mary Ann said, is that um, this, is, this was especially true when we wrote the book, that um, our, we wanted our book to really reflect the perspectives of both white families and Black families as they try to, um, ass to assist their children in understanding and grappling with um, the, the racial history of our countries. Um, there have been other books that um, may have addressed um, I guess I'll say anti-racism from one perspective or the other, but we really wanted this to be uh, a presentation of the perspectives that a white family would hopefully be able to share with their children as well as a black family and then to be able to put it together. And as Mary Ann said, to have the children to apply it to um, situations in which they encountered. Should I go? Okay. So, um, I wrote One of a Kind Like Me, Unico Como Yo, and Robert illustrated it. And it's a book based on my family. So um, when my child was young, um, they identified yeah, as a boy uh, who liked girl things. And um, we're a multiracial family. At the time, we were also a single parent family. And so it's, a, it's about a, a family that has a lot of diverse identities. And the child in the story named Danny wants to be a princess in the school parade. And um, this book was challenged in Columbus County, North Carolina by parents who were concerned that, um, or said they were concerned that the book was confusing their children around gender and also school board members who said that gender identity politics really had no place in the schools and that it was age, age inappropriate. For young children. All right. Um, so let's talk about the process of writing and publishing the books. Did it ever occur to you as you were writing these books that they might be censored? Uh, and, you know, in addition to that, how did it feel when you found out that the books had been banned? I'd like to start with Lauren and Rob on this one. So when I was writing the book, I didn't really think too much about it being censored specifically, but I knew that there were gonna be a lot of families that were uncomfortable with the topic area because it's a very controversial topic and not everybody's supportive of this issue being shared with their children. Um, and when the book got challenged in North Carolina, I had mixed feelings about it. I mean, on the one hand, I was like, yay, the book actually made it that far and somebody's talking about it in North Carolina. Um, and then on the other hand, I was really upset and, um, and discouraged because I'm thinking about children in those schools that will not be able to have access to a book like that that shows that there are children like this and they may be children like that, right? Um, and I was also just very, very discouraged because it's personal for me. It's like, you don't want a book about my child in your school, which tells me that a child like mine is not welcome in your school either. Yeah, and I would just say, in creating it, I wasn't at all thinking about will this book be censored or will people want to take it off the shelf. But I knew when Lauren first, you know, presented the idea that it was groundbreaking and new, not only to have a book about like a, a child of color, but a child that may be questioning their gender and also to have it be bilingual. So like a whole new crop of people could access it. Um, I just thought it was really dope and that it would be really important story to get out there, um, not only for people who already have family members who are dealing with this, but for people who don't. Um, and then when we when uh, we got the word that it got banned, um, it's yeah, it's, it's kind of like a mixed feeling of like a little excited that people are getting pissed off because it's like pushing some buttons, pushing some comfort zone. Like, yeah, this is this is happening. you got to deal with it. Um, and then frustrated because I, uh, as a kid who grew up just really hating to read, I know that it'll be harder for them to see that book on the shelf. Um, so it's a mix, a mixed bag of feelings. 
Hey, Marietta and Marianne, what, what about you and something in our, happened in our town? Mm -hmm. I was trying to um, unmute myself, sorry. Mm -hmm. You muted yourself back, Marietta. <laughs> Marietta, you re-muted yourself. <laughs> For some reason, this button keeps going in place, so I apologize, I'm sorry. What I was gonna say is certainly to echo what both Lauren and Robert said when Mary Ann uh, approached uh, both me and Ann about writing the book, um, we certainly did not think or think at all that the book would be be banned or censored. We did know it was an important story to tell based upon the work that we had done with um, underserved minority um, children down here in Atlanta at, um, at Grady Hospital. Um, we first got the inkling, as a matter of fact, that the book was going to, and we knew it would be controversial. We didn't really expect the kind of reaction we got um, until really very early on when the book was published in, in um, 2018 when um, an article from The Hill came out um, if you see blue, run if you're black, which basically suggested that uh, black people, that, that our book was really um, just encouraging uh, black children to really be fearful of policemen. And that was not our intent at all. Um, I remember being upset and surprised about it. And my daughter, also, my daughter shared your views, uh, Robert, that I think she said something like, if you're not popping, they're not talking because never heard that before, but that's what she said. And, um, and we've continued with this process and uh, we've learned a lot about ourselves in this process and how strongly each of us believes that this is a message that needs to be told and censorship or not, we're not going to be silenced. When our uh, last year, our book was number six on the 10 most challenged books list we didn't re we didn't realize we were quite that controversial but the other side of our reaction was we were very proud to be on a list with Jason Reynolds and yes, everybody yes. else that was on Andy that Thomas list. Mm -hmm. yeah so, oh yeah so it was a uh, backhanded compliment but we we took it as a as a compliment I'm going to go ahead and sneak in a question from uh, one of our um, viewers because it's related to this this question. Um, Melanie wants to know how you learned about the censorship. Um, a parent, a media specialist, the news was at the ALA top 10 list for something happened in a town. How did you find out? Well, we found out about it. I, we found out about it, I think, from the publisher about the ALA list. But even before that, we had been approached by teachers and parents in different schools across the country, because our email address is pretty easy to find. And they would email us and say, hey, my school is having, my school board is having a meeting tonight about this book. They're getting ready to ban it, or they're going to challenge it, or they won't let us read it. Or a fourth grade teacher got in trouble for showing the YouTube video of the book being read. Do you have anything we can say? And so people just reached out to us about it and we would be in communication with them and try to support them in standing up for the book. Lauren, how did you- I found out about it on Twitter. Uh, a teacher in a neighboring school district uh, read about it in the paper and it turned out that we were actually on the front page of the local news reporter. Um, the book, there's this huge image of the book cover and then a whole article about uh, what happened um, without ever reaching out to us or anyone that supported the book, but really just focusing on the parents and the school board members that were against having the book there. Great, thank you. Um, let's, let's start talking about the impacts of censorship. Um, I wanna start first by asking y'all, how the censorship of your books has um, has affected the work you make now. Do you find yourself tempted to self-censor? And if so, how do you deal with it? Uh, Anne, Marietta, and Marianne, would you like to kick us off? Um, well, we are apparently gluttons for punishment because our second book is a story that takes place in the context of community gun violence. So certainly um, gun violence and guns in America are not a, uh, are, are a, another controversial topic, although we don't know of any challenges yet to that, that book, but they may be coming. And a, a third book that I've written with a 
another co-author who is a uh, Latina psychiatrist um, is coming out, but it's going to be about a, a Latina child dealing with her father's detention. So it touches on immigration policy dilemmas. So I don't really think, um, you know, we, we are just so committed to this work. And what all the books have in common is based on our very strong belief as professionals that, that have worked with children our entire career, we believe kids are aware of and are impacted by these social issues that are um, impacting all of our communities. And the more we can do to help kids be informed and compassionate citizens, you know, the earlier, the better. So um, we remain very committed to to tackling, well, to telling stories that matter in, in the, and helping families discuss issues together. And we're glad that our publisher, Imagination Press, is committed to publishing these books as well. Um, most recently, I, um, I've worked on a, a book called Alejandria Fights Back. And um, I would say for the, for the most part, my career as an illustrator in kids' books um, and as a writer has been to try and do um, a lot of everyday life stories, like just mm. and, and kind of going with that, like the personal being political, like people just living their their lives, like just doing what they do. And but this book that most recently I just did, um, it has to deal with uh, gentrification and uh, displacement, eviction, things like that. And so that's that's something recently that I got to work on with a bunch of people. And um, that's really fun. Um, it's it's a tough topic. And I know some people aren't with that, but I think you know, it, it has to be talked about since so many children specifically are dealing with it. I'm not writing a book now, <clears throat> but if I were writing a book, I would not censor myself. <laughs> I think that it's really, really important to keep um, speaking about the topics that make some people uncomfortable, but on the other hand, are really, really critical for, for the lives. Of many people that don't get their stories told. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, I, I love hearing that you're not gonna censor yourself. <laughs> so um, for your, a few years now, the American Library Association has noted a trend among the top 10 most challenged books. Most of them have been challenged for LGBTQ plus content. How does the censorship of these materials harm young readers? Lauren, can you kick us off? Uh, <clears throat> well, I wanna say, first of all, that there were no books that I knew of when my child, who is now 32, <laughs> was in elementary school that uh, affirmed my child and said, you are okay. You're more than okay. You're wonderful and beautiful exactly how you are and you're welcome in this school. There was nothing like that. And now there are a series of those books um, some of them not as diverse as I would like them to be in other ways, um, but there are many more books and many of those books are being challenged. Um, and this is really harmful, um, first of all, for any child who is gender nonconforming, who is transgender, or who just doesn't feel like they want to follow gender expectations and stereotypes. It's really harmful because it's basically saying you don't belong here. Um, and, and it de denies them something that affirms them and celebrates them and tells them that they're beautiful. Um, and then it's also really harmful to other children who may sort of fit in to gender stereotypes. I don't think anyone really does 100%, but maybe more fits in with gender stereotypes and gender expectations because they don't get the benefit of learning about their, their friends, their fellow students that are, and all the beauty and joy that they, they bring to the world. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate, like as um, coming from someone who as a kid just really detested reading, like when I went to the library, I hated going. I didn't want to go. My dad made me go, go, go get a book, go get something to read. And it was just whack. It was just I was like, I don't want to do this. Like, ain't nothing here for me. Like there was in the librarians at the time weren't very helpful, but I know now as a, as an author that librarians put in so much work to get kids really engaged. 
but um, I think it's harmful in the sense that like, you know, I'm not a, a queer kid. I identify as a man. And at that time, as a boy, it would have been helpful to see a book like ours or, um, or y'all's book as well, just to be able to see something like that, that speaks to the experience. Um, so it's really harmful for any kid who is not like the, the book that they're seeing to not be able to expand their knowledge and like see what others, someone else's life is like. Um, and it's super harmful to kids who are growing up trying to just live and be themselves, like not even on some revolutionary stuff, just trying to just be and uh, being poked at and pushed aside and um, told, you know, you know, we don't really care. So I, it is really harmful and I'm really thankful for the work that y'all do. I would agree 100% that um, it's really important to really, I guess I'll say show and illustrate the diversity of all kinds of groups. I don't know why it keeps popping over to mute. I don't, I really don't understand it. It's never happened before, but there, there are so many, um, I guess I'll say people, diverse kinds of people. I'm just gonna hold on to it and see if that does it. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, be it because of, of gender non-conformity, be it because of race, be it because of ethnicity, anything. But it's really important to be open to embracing the... You're muted again, Marietta. I know, I'm gonna, uh, okay. I don't know. Maybe. Someone's hacking your computer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right, someone's censoring Sorry. your computer, yeah. <laughs> it's all good, the foibles of technology. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, so let's expand the, the conversation even further. The release of ALA's top 10 most challenged books in, uh, of 2020 list, which included something ha happened in our town, noted an emerging trend. More books that address racism or discuss anti-racism are being targeted. We've noted for a while that, that diverse content is a frequent target, but now they're starting to target specific types of books. Um, Additionally, nearly a dozen states have now passed legislation targeting the 1619 Project and educational materials that deal with race. Why is it important to protect access to these materials and what are the lasting effects of this censorship? Marianne, Marietta, and Anne, can you kick us off? Sadly, Georgia is one of those states. Um, in fact, many states have state boards of education that have um, past resolutions that state essentially they don't want white kids to feel discomfort around facing honest history, which is in the United States, our history, which includes in the United States, among other things, um, our history of slavery. Um, and so when you take those books away from the teachers or out of the library, then you're, you're depriving the kids of an opportunity to learn their history. And in our view, to change the old pattern into a new pattern. Um, the objections that we have to, to these resolutions include, you know, it's an outmoded, you know, view of racism that they have. They, they think of, they define racism as based on an individual's or group's intentions rather than the outcomes, right? Um, and it's also an outmoded view of diversity, you know, where diversity is something to be tolerated, whereas we think it's something to be celebrated and appreciated. And one of the lines in our book, the older sister of the white um, younger child says, you never know who's going to be your best friend. And that's our view about diversity. Diversity is something that should be celebrated, that brings value. Um, so in many ways, our book runs counter to these resolutions. And we feel like our book um, provides one way to help children um, face our history, but also um, use that knowledge to create a different pattern moving forward. I'll stop there. I'm going to try to respond and hope that my mute button uh, cooperates. Uh, what I wanted to say is that I think it's really important that the, that the story of this country be told accurately mm -hmm. and truthfully. And um, for many, many years, um, the part um, of our nation's history has been really restricted in terms of slavery, the pervasiveness of slavery, how it's continued to um, be reflected in institutional racism today, in the educational materials that our children um, read. So it's really important that um, 
that we as a nation, if we're going to be, if we want to make steps forward to be more inclusive, that we tell our story, that we learn from our story. Because if we don't do that, then we'll continue to make the same mistakes. And I think that these resolutions are certainly pushing us in that direction. And it is frustrating that so much attention is being uh, paid to the <laughs> ostensible feelings of, of white children. And we, we kind of have two responses. One is that we are not finding that kids are misunderstanding the message of our book or that white children are getting traumatized mm -hmm. by our book. When we ask kids what our book is about, they say it's about treating people fairly and that you shouldn't treat people unfairly based on the color of their skin. They understand it. And they might be a little upset about it and they probably should be a little upset about the, a little or a lot upset about the history and uh, yeah, and some of the kids get kind of, you know, indignant, righteously indignant, um, or some may be sad, but isn't that what we all should be feeling if we face face our history? But but kids are not traumatized or immobilized. And like Marianne said, they're, the book is, you know, geared to empower children to, to do something constructive and different. And I forgot what my second point is, but I'll stop there. <laughs> I just want to say that we cannot change the, we cannot do anything to move forward around racism if we're not willing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And this idea that children need to be shielded from these conversations, they are not shielded from the reality, especially Black, Indigenous, and other children of color. It's the reality that they live every day. They're not being shielded from it. And the idea that we can only talk about things that make white people comfortable mm -hmm. is not going to move us forward as a society. Thank you, Lauren. That was the second part of my point that I lost track of, which is what about the feelings of the Black and Brown and Indigenous children? <laughs> Those have historically been overlooked. And, you know, this backlash is sort of encouraging that once again. And I, I'll just add to that. Um, I think a lot of times what uh, people want to do is um, highlight the uh, the cases of individuals where well, that person didn't say something like a, a, a racial slur, or they didn't do something to make it more personal when a lot of that is just a whole bunch of uh, talk and covers to try and cover the fact that racism is not about just, you know, individuals or personality. It's about a systemic uh, history and that mm -hmm. if they succeed in keeping people off that, then they won't be able to see the systemic ties from the past up until the present. I mean, we're talking about housing, we're talking about education, we're talking about, uh, you know, the the placement of, of freeways, like there's just so many systemic things that I think, you know, if, if they find that their constituencies really get hold to that and understand, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. And they already in a lot of trouble, because that's why they are scrambling to get, get somebody's attention on that when people are already aware, but becoming even more aware. So and I think that may be part of the reason our book in particular has been targeted, because it does, in a very developmentally appropriate way, begin to introduce children to systemic racism. I mean, it introduces slavery as sort of the start of things in this country, but it mentions, you know, voting uh, suppression and, and segregation and housing discrimination. So it begins to get children thinking and, and talking about uh, those things. And obviously the police shooting as the event that starts these family discussions going is, is speaking to um, racism within the criminal justice system. So um, I think that's part of the reason it's been threatening. So uh, in the last few weeks, in particular, we've seen attacks on children's literature make national headlines. Um, there was the recent removal of several children's books and teaching resources about the civil rights movement and anti-racism um, in Central York, Pennsylvania. Fortunately, in that case, it was overturned because the students and the parents and the community protested. 
Um, you know, I think you've, you've touched on this, but let's expand upon it. What are people afraid of? And do you think children are protected when these materials are removed? Um, good. I think that children, I think that there's what people say they're afraid of and then what people are really afraid of. And those are two different things. So for example, one of the things that people said they're afraid of is um, indoctrination, right? Uh, we don't want our children to feel guilty about being white or feel bad about being white. Um, and then with, in the case of our book, it, it was like, we don't want our kids to be confused. You know, we don't want gender identity politics. Underneath the rhetoric, I'm not really sure what people are really afraid of, but one of the things that I think is really important to kind of challenge is this idea that it's only okay for us to talk about reality in your terms. Mm -hmm. We cannot talk about reality from the perspective of people that have diverse and marginalized identities. That's not okay. That's a good distinction between what people say they're afraid of and what they're really afraid of. I think that um, you know, progress towards racial equity in this country has always been accompanied by pushback. Um, you know, people who feel like the status quo is threatened, right? Um, and it's also, I, I wanna add this, it's sometimes unclear who is threatened. It's not necessarily the people that are trying to get the book banned that are, that are the ones that are threatened. Like one of the questions I often have when I hear about a book being banned or challenged is which voices are being empowered and which voices are not being represented and who's funding this? Like, if, you know, where is the money coming from to mount a big campaign against a book, right? I've heard of several incidents in recent weeks, one most recently in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, where some parents received an email from parents in their community saying that they wanted parents to come to a school board meeting and, um, and stand and oppose a tax levy because of it was tied to certain books that were deemed controversial. And some other pans, parents got the, got the email and organized. And so hundreds of people came out to this meeting and stood up against censorship, right? Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's not clear who is doing, who is really mounting the opposition to these books, who is really pro-censorship and, and who is funding that? So I'm actually gonna throw in a quick question here. Um, uh, mostly, I, I, I just wanna get your comment on this. Uh, this morning, ta Coates spoke with CBS this morning about banned book speak and the censorship of his work. And one of the comments he made is, when you start saying to a kid or your kids, I only want you to read things that validate my point of view. That is no longer education. That is indoctrination. He flipped mm. the indoctrination argument mm. on its head. Mm -hmm. So could you all share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would say um, I had a discussion with my uh, teenager all the time because I, I come from a, a family that believes in a lot of the things that all of us on this call believe in. Um, but I also say, you know, this is just, you know, my point of view, or this is just your grandmother's point of view, or this is this is just someone that you know, um, you know, look, look for as many point of views as you can and uh, make up your own mind. And I think it's really about, you know, getting them to think critically and, uh, you know, use a lot of different viewpoints and think about what, what makes the most sense to you. And if, if we're raising them right, it's, you know, getting them to really spot who's trying to take advantage of others in this situation. Or like uh, Marianne said, who's, whose voices are being censored and who's being empowered. Well, I certainly, you know, would, would, would agree with what you just said, Robert. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about um, the times when we reared our children. You know, we were uh, fortunate to be in Atlanta where there are lots of, uh, of, of role models who are, you know, for, for young Black kids who are professionals. And um, that doesn't happen, you know, in a lot of cities and for a, in a lot of 
a lot of, uh, especially, um, I guess I'll say, um, underserved populations can't can't see that they would be able to triumph, you know, over the uh, the circumstances in which they've been born. Um, they have a hard time, you know, overcoming uh, negative messages from the media. And then, and as a psychologist, you know, trying to attack low self-esteem and where did that come from? You know, all of those things are, are, are really important. So um, what, what we try to do as parents was to really surround our kids with really positive messages about who they were, to place themselves in lots of situations where they could see people of color who are in leadership and empowering positions and to have open conversations with them about choices which um, which they might not understand. You know, for instance, with, with my daughter, I never bought her, I only bought her dolls that were African-American, which is kind of hard to do many years ago because it was hard to find African-American dolls, which was not to say that I don't have friends who are non-African-American, you know, but again, given the pervasiveness of, uh, of how how often you see white dolls, white people on commercials and all of that. And you never would see that, you know, with, with black little girls very much back then. It was important to me as a mother to start to try to enrich her spirit, even at that time, that you can be beautiful and pretty. You may not look like the, the dolls you see on TV. You may not look like the, the people you see on TV, you know, but you know, it's important to, to start very early on. It's also important, I think, to recognize that there's a dominant narrative that we all get exposed to on the daily, and I think that's some of what you were speaking to, that the dominant narrative that we get exposed to on a daily basis centers whiteness, mm -hmm. centers heterosexism, mm -hmm. centers people who are cisgender, and marginalizes people from other identities, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of recognizing the need to bring in diverse perspectives. It's not like diversity, everything is treated equal. It's like diversity, we're in a systematic exclusion situation and that needs to be changed. Yeah, it's, it is highly ironic <laughs> that, you know, that our books are being attacked for indoctrinating children when our books are just uh, giving a little, you know, 1000 word counter counter argument to, as you, as you said, the dominant narrative that, that has been so forceful in our educational system and our media and, you know, our, our entire society. Thank you all so much for those powerful perspectives. Um, so what advice do you have for other creators, as well as students, educators, librarians, and parents who want to prevent the removal of books in their communities and around the country? Are there any resources you would recommend? Uh, Marianne, Marietta, and Anne, can you kick us off? Well, I think uh, to the degree that um, I'll speak to educators, I guess, uh, primarily since that's where our book has particularly been challenged. Um, and I'm sure I know that many educators are doing this, but to try to get ahead of it a bit uh, by trying to form diversity, equity, inclusion committees in your school with representation from teachers and parents and to have an ongoing effort to, um, to have honest and diverse curriculum materials and equitable discipline procedures, et cetera, so that if you've got a group already formed that's in, invested uh, in that, that's that's helpful uh, to, to have so that there is, so that if an effort is, is made towards uh, censorship, um, that that there's a group already operating that, that can present the other side of that um, argument. Um, in terms of resources, um, I think uh, there's three favorites that we have, and I'm sure there's others out there. One is the Anti-Defamation League certainly has uh, a lot of uh, materials, both um, book lists and lessons, uh, but also materials um, and programs uh, for teachers and schools to participate in that are promoting uh, diversity. 
a second similar resources learning for justice um, materials from the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center. And then a, a third less, less well-known one is from a Seattle high school teacher. Um, I think his first name is Josh. His last name is Greenberg. And he has a website called Citizenship and Social Justice. And he, very, he was a pretty early on person. I'm not sure how many years ago, maybe five to 10 years ago, he had uh, you know, so a, a uh, course he taught in his high school about social justice and racial justice and citizenship. And one family challenged it, which we find with our book too, like one, or one, one police officer challenges our book and goes to the superintendent. And anyway, he, his course got banned, but similar to what just happened in Pennsylvania, uh, his students rallied and supported him and many of their parents did. And eventually they were able to get his course reinstated, but he has a very helpful uh, website with, with materials and kind of his story and how he went about uh, fighting um, the, the ban on his course. So those are three resources uh, that I especially like. And to that, also... I, would add, I would add organization. Like, you know, use your own social media contacts and skills. This group in Whitefish Bay passed out signs that said, teach truth to people that were opposing the censorship um, uh, resolution. Um, so get people to show up at the school board meetings. Make sure your voices are heard. Um, what I was gonna say is something that's really simplistic is, before people overreact about our book, they should read our book. They should they should read the book. And they, should, <laughs> and they should and if they were to read the book, they should also look at the resources at the back of the book, which are mm -hmm. which Marianne alluded to earlier. Because you know some because there have been certainly video readings which don't incorporate the Sorry, really important. <laughs> which don't incorporate, you know, what, uh, you know, the, what we were trying to really uh, present, you know, there's the story and then there are resources to help parents to really engage with their children um, about the story, about uh, difficult and challenging situations for, um, for not only uh, black children, for white children, for brown children, um, role models, places, read the book, look at the resources before you overreact. Just don't react based upon what one person said who may have had, um, and I don't know who may have heard something from someone else about the book. Yeah, I would, I would, um... I would venture a guess, Lauren, that many folks that react to your book have not read it just because it's so gentle and sweet and age appropriate in the way it introduces its material. But I, I would not be surprised if many folks have just read the little blurb and, oh, my God. <laughs> you know? uh, so. Yeah, in the county where it was challenged, actually there were several present, several classrooms present in the presentation that was done by a college student. And there was no problem. Like several schools um, have, I've read this book in many, many different schools, had lots of really great conversations with kids in many different schools. And kids generally don't have a problem with it. And so if parents would actually listen to kids, you know, and then if a kid is confused, like, oh, I didn't know that a boy could be a princess or do, can boys turn into girls? Those are questions that kids have. And rather than reacting like, okay, that's harming your kid that they have that question. It's like, how about encouraging that kind of um, curiosity and helping the child learn more. Yeah, it's an opportunity to clear up your child's confusion. Like, why is that a problem? It's an opportunity. And I just wanted to say, like, learn from people who have done this. Like, what just happened in York, Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. It was students and parents that organized and said, no, we're not having this. We're not having this. And, and one of the kids said it was like a dagger mm -hmm. in my heart, mm -hmm. you know? That, that these books were being banned. And, and they're leaders, they're leaders that we can learn from. Yeah, I would just say um, as, a, as a parent, um, 
one of the things that I think is uh, helpful is to, for one, go to the to the public library. Like you don't always have to to buy the books. It's really helpful to request it at your local library, mm -hmm. and to uh, if they don't have it, you know, find out you know where they do have it and give it to the librarian or fill out the suggestion box. I think uh, websites like uh, Social Justice Books. Um, Teaching for Change or Rethinking Schools, We Need Diverse Books, they all have really great lists as well where you can go on there and find uh, tailored specific categories of what you're looking for um, and then present that to folks. And then, yeah, just adding on to what everyone else said about organizing and like, you know, the students and the parents and the teachers, like they all have a lot of power, a lot more. So organize. Well, thanks everyone for sharing those uh, resources. I also just want to add really quickly that a lot of the organizations in the Banned Books Week Coalition are prepared to help. So if you run into a censorship incident in your community, if you see a news item, if somebody who is a patron at your library just complains verbally, it is absolutely fine to reach out to these organizations. They can provide advice, they will write letters of support, they will get the word out and, and help you defend these books. I'll drop a link in the Facebook comments to uh, places where you can report censorship. So can I just... Um, Make oh, go really, ahead, Lauren. <laughs> I just want to say the National Coalition Against Censorship wrote this really amazing support letter for us to the district. Mm. And it was very much appreciated and really felt so supportive at a time when there wasn't any support locally that we could find. Yeah, I'm just going to add censorship succeeds when we don't know about it. So the more you can do to spread the word when you see it happening, mm -hmm. the less likely they will be to, uh, it, that the less likely the books will actually be banned. So, and the earlier that advocates find out, the better equipped we are to defend materials. So let's get on to our last question. Um, if anybody has any questions for the Q&A, please feel free to add those in the comments on Facebook. This is our last question. I don't know about y'all. But one of my favorite things about Banned Books Week is the way it expands my to read pile. Uh, I mean, like so much taller than me now. Uh, the theme of this year's Banned Books Week is Books Unite Us, Censorship Divides Us. What are some examples of books that unite us? What are your reading recommendations? Rob and Lauren, do you want to kick us off? Um, I was looking at this earlier and trying to think of books that I've actually read rather than trying to suggest something that I haven't read that looks tight. Um, so some comics that I, I've actually read like This One Summer and uh, In Real Life. Um, this One Summer is by the Tamaki family, I will say. And then uh, In Real Life is by Corey Doctorow and Jin Wang, I believe. Um, those are both really great books to get uh, young people reading. And like comics are, are just an awesome way to just get into reading and enjoy and having fun reading. So I would say those are great books in that. I don't, I don't even know. I think the, for this one, some of the mention was something about someone being a lesbian or something like that. I don't know about the other one, but I feel like those are both really great stories to get anyone to jump in and want to read. Um, and then I just think the thing that unites us is like every, every year we get new scientific discoveries about new things that we didn't know before. And it's, you know, all these people who are scared of new voices being heard, like too bad, you're going to have to deal with it. Like all these new voices are coming and they're not going to be quiet. So, you know, whether it was like the Mexican American studies program being shut down in Arizona or this new backlash with the 69 project, um, they all give, you know, I, I feel help to unite people in their hunger for more knowledge and wanting to know more stories. A couple of the, go ahead. Oh, I just wanna jump in really quick on this one summer. So I was challenged because there was a mention of, uh, of lesbian moms uh, and it also depicts teen pregnancy uh, in a few panels. Um, part of the reason this one summer was challenged is because uh, it is the first uh, comic to receive a Caldecott honor and it's meant mm -hmm. for ages 12 and up. And a lot of people assume the Caldecott honor is only for like little kid books. And so a lot of people shelved the book without being aware that it's actually meant for, for older students. And so there are also a lot of complaints about inappropriate for age group because mm -hmm. folks didn't do all of the research they needed to. So sorry to interrupt, Lauren, you take it from here. Uh, a couple of the books that I've read that are also for older children. One is The Hate You Give mm -hmm. um, by Angie Thomas. And I, uh, that book was supported by the California Teachers Association. It was on their uh, California Reads list. And that's how I found out about it. 
and I absolutely love the book and it gave me like a, some perspective um, that I, I wouldn't have otherwise had if I hadn't had a chance to read the book. And then also Alex Dino, who I know is gonna be doing a panel later, wrote a book um, that uh, the official title is George um, and it's about a transgender child. And it's also one of my favorite chapter books uh, addressing these topics. Um, I would certainly agree with you, Lauren, in terms of The Hate You Give. I love that book. Um, when I thought about this question, I kind of went, I guess I'll say old school, all the way back. And I thought about this book by Toni Morrison called The Bluest Eye. Mm. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Great one. But I think that's a that's a great book, which builds empathy, you know, for what it was like, you know, to be a, a child, a black child who had lots of negative messages about herself and what she wanted to do was to have blue eyes. And so I think that's a that's a really, I think, book that builds empathy. Some other books that are necessarily, I guess I'll say books that um, the children would enjoy, but I think are really good in terms of, 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 uh, of trying to expand perspectives are books that Anne and Marianne and I have utilized and sometimes um, suggest. And those are books by Jennifer Harvey, you know, Raising Anti-Racist Children and also um, Raising White Kids by Rebecca. You know, we think that those books really do help um, non-parents, non you know, parents who have white kids or are parents of, of, of black or brown kids to kind of really have, know some steps that they can take to really start to open up their, their minds and their family's mind to being anti-racist. For me, um, when I think about picture books, I certainly love Jacqueline Goodson's The Day You Begin. Um, oh, no, it really geez. speaks to all sorts of ways of feeling left out. Um, and new to a situation like school. Um, I also like reading books that are um, fantasy or you know puts you, puts you in a magical world, but in a different cultural context. So recently, I read a book called Akata Wish. Which have you guys heard heard of this book? Um, which is about it's set in Nigeria. And it has all the elements of great fantasy, you know, great relationships between characters, great story arcs, you know, a visually rich images. Um, but it's set in Nigeria, you know, so that's new for me. Um, and that was really um, a good read. Um, so I would say, you know, just stuff that you like to read, but in a different cultural context, I think is also mm -hmm. important to do. Any more recommendations come to mind as we're, as we're here? Well, I'll hold up the last one. I was thinking of picture <laughs> books too. And actually the, the picture book that Marianne mentioned, The Day You Begin, and this book also, both of these were among the banned books uh, in Pennsylvania. And they're both, to Marietta's point, if you read these books, <laughs> it would really be hard <laughs> to say that they're, controversial uh, or presenting a message that that anyone could object to. So this is just a book for very young children, totally celebrating the fact that we come in all different skin colors in a in a very loving way and, and talking about what's inside too and that what what's inside matters, but um, but not in a we're all the same colorblind way in, in a really celebrating uh, diversity of, of skin tones. Mm -hmm. All right, we had, a, we had a question from Kathleen uh, in the comments. Kathleen wanted to know if you had any advice for, for kids themselves in fighting censorship, if, if you could speak to kids about what they can do to prevent censorship, what would you say to them? I Talk to you. Say, go no, go ahead, Lauren. No, you go, Robert. All right. I was gonna say I used to tell them when I was an art teacher all the time that if, if they they were saying, hey, "Mr. Robert, I don't like your class," I was like, "All right, well, get a petition going and tell me which class you would like." Um, I've seen kids do this recently in uh, in my city in Oakland, so I think getting a petition going, uh, it's just like getting all your students, your fellow students on board. Yeah. 
And I was just going to say, talk to people about why diverse books are important to you. Let your parents know or your family, your, your grownups, let, let talk to your fellow students um, and really why these books are important to you and, and um, help sort of challenge any kind of thinking that, that they're not important or that they're not, that they're harmful. And I would add to that, you know, your opinions and ideas are important. Just because people don't agree with you doesn't mean they're not important. They're valuable. And I would also say that it's by really reading diverse books that, you know, that your whole world is just opened to you. Mm -hmm. You know, and as we said in, in our book, you never know who might be your best friend. So by, you know, certainly reading books about diverse cultures, it really does expand the different options that you might consider exploring, you know, in life, through your education, through your travel. So you, do you want to, to live in a world that's very, you know, I guess I say has monovision only, or would you like to have an expanded version of the world and what's out there? All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't have any other questions in the comments, but um, I want to just say thank you to all of you for your amazing words today and for your ongoing defense of your books and other books from censorship. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to make a quick plug. We have lots of great events happening over the next week. The Band Book Suite Coalition's next event is tomorrow with our inaugural honorary chair. Ask Jason Reynolds anything about Band Books Week will be live here on the Band Books Week Facebook page um, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We have some great questions from teens and librarians and educators from around the country for Jason, and I think he's going to knock it out of the park. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful time celebrating the ways in which books uh, unite us during Band Books Week. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.